indigenous peoples and indigenous territories. So we have a lot of work to do to implement the true meaning and spirit of the treaties, which as I understand is about sharing the land in relationships of reciprocity that affirm all life, both animate and inanimate. Um, so my name is Emily Eden. I'm a prof at the University of Regina. I have been studying Saskatchewan's oil economy since 2011, and being here today with all of you is somewhat of a dream come true for me. When I moved back to the province in 2009, the province was in the middle of an oil boom, and there was no space really to talk about alternative economies or the tremendous power and influence of the industry in our province. And I'm starting to feel like things might be changing. Um, and that's the, really the goal of this summit, to get the idea of transition out there to the public and to build a sort of unified message on the need for whole-scale just transition. So the impasse that we've been at for some time now, where jobs are pitted against the environment, in my opinion, is tired. And we're hoping that in some small way this summit's going to start um, to change uh, that discourse. Most of the funding I'll mention for the summit comes from the Corporate Mapping Project, which is, uh, if you know universities, is a sure funded um, partnership grant um, with universities and, um, uh, and partners across Western Canada. And that project is looking into the corporate power of the carbon extractive industries. But we're also happy to have SAS Forward on board, Climate Justice Saskatoon, the Regina Public Interest Research Group, and uniform. So you should all have an agenda. There were some stacks of them at your table. If you're missing some, we have more. We can send them around. Um, you'll notice that there's one small change. Reagan Boychuk, whose workshop I was really looking forward to, um, had a death in his family this week, and um, the funeral is tomorrow in Calgary, and so he needs to be there with his family. So the small change which is reflected in your agenda is that we're moving the coal workshop down into that slot tomorrow in the morning. Um, and David Gray Donald from Briarpatch Magazine will be still hosting a discussion about phasing out the oil and gas industry um, in the afternoon um, with the other two concurrent ones. Um, so the topic is still there if you want to um, engage with that topic. So importantly, we're inviting participants, you all, in the breakout groups in the afternoon to co-create messages that we can use in a campaign to build momentum for a just transition to a low carbon economy. And the organi organizers of the summit have committed to creating social media shareables, and we want everyone here to think about how you can also contribute to building the momentum uh, that we need to make in terms of a just transition. Some of the other outcomes have already happened. Um, an opinion piece that I wrote was published in the CBC on Thursday. Yesterday on Blue Sky, um, the noon call-in radio show, the whole show was devoted to transition. It went really well. Um, and you'll see media here um, throughout the day, so feel free to speak to them. Especially, um, I imagine that Claudio Canada might show up, so if you're a French speaker, <laughs> um, get in touch with us. So that's all in terms of housekeeping. We'll tell you a little bit more about how the breakout groups in the afternoon are going to work after the two morning um, presentations. But I would like to call on Dave Sachin to come to the front now. And I'll tell you a little bit about Dave. He's the director of the Prairie Adaptation Research Collaborative at the University of Regina and a professor of geography and environmental studies. His main research interests are one, the climate and hydrology of the past millennium and how this knowledge of the past can inform our understanding of future climate and water supplies. And the second interest is planned adaptation to minimize the adverse impacts of climate change on the natural capital of Western Canada. During 2011 to 16, Dave co-directed an interdisciplinary study of the vulnerability of agricultural communities to climate extremes in Chile, Argentina, Colombia, Brazil, and the Canadian Prairies. And he's the lead author of the Prairies chapter of the National Assessment of Climate Change, which is due for release in 2020. So Dave will speak for 20-ish minutes, and then there'll be a little bit of time for questions.
thanks, Emily, and congratulations on succeeding in getting all these people here today. And it's nice to see so many familiar faces. Emily told me to stick to the science, so it's going to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that it's already after lunch. At least you're fresh to, to uh, assimilate some of this information. And it's good to be in the language of science, which is graphs and numbers. That's how we speak as scientists. But you're smart people, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. And this first graph is the temperature of the world every year back to 1880. And the way it's presented is, if it was a cold year, it's blue, and if it's a warm year, it's red. And it shows quite clearly that every year since the early 1980s has been warmer than average, and increasingly warmer. In fact, this past month, September, was the 405th consecutive month with the temperature above average. So this is why we call it global warming. When you look at the temperature of the entire world, it's very, very clear that the Earth is warming. Of course, the obvious question is, OK, the climate has changed over geologic time. Maybe this is part of a natural cycle. Well, the way to answer that question is to look at the temperature of the Earth for the past 1,000 years or 2,000 years and compare the recent warming to the cycles of the past. And that's some research that I do with my students. So one of my students took a picture of me with a chainsaw, and I'm cutting into a tamarack tree. We know it's a tamarack because the ski resort calls it the tamarack chair. We didn't have to identify the tree. And the reason I'm cutting into this dead tamarack is because this is the limit of tree growth in the Rocky Mountains. This is the Castle Mountain Ski Resort. And of course, they got rid of a lot of trees in order to build the ski runs, so we had access to dead wood. And because it's a limit of tree growth, these trees only grow if they have heat. The reason that there's no trees above this elevation is there just isn't enough heat. So what controls the growth of trees at the upper tree line is the amount of heat. And therefore, if we collect wood, we can find a record of the temperature at this location over the lifespan of the tree. And some of these trees are almost 1,000 years old. And we can collect dead wood that's been lying around and go back even further. So I've been doing this, and a couple of years ago, I was approached by some scientists from California and said, we're going we're gonna to collect information from thousands of scientists doing the same thing. Scientists who study glaciers, sediments in lakes, sediments in the ocean, and trees like me, put it all together. And what we discovered was, if you look at the last 2,000 years, the temperature of the world was slowly going down, down, down until about 150 years ago, and it reversed and began going up quite rapidly. So this is a very clear indication that the warming recently is quite unusual in the context of the natural climate of the world. And of course, what happened 150 years ago is we began burning coal and oil and gas, fossil fuels. And the amount of warming that's recorded here can be explained entirely in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas that have been produced over the last 150 years. In other words, this is a clear indication of the greenhouse gas forcing of global warming. And you can see the change in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air for the past 400,000 years. This is from glacier ice in Antarctica. And you can see the fluctuation naturally of carbon dioxide and then how it's gone up rapidly in the last 150 years, driving the global increase in temperature. Here's another way of showing the global increase in temperature. This is month by month, the 10 warmest years since 1880. And if you can read the legend, 1998 is there. But every other year since 2005. So all of the 
warm years that we've experienced have been recently. Our current year is in black, that's 2018, it's not over yet. So scientists are sort of projecting where the rest of the year might go. But already 2018 is the fourth warmest year in the last 140 years. The only years that are warmer are the preceding three years. So if you look at the entire world, it's clear. We say it's unequivocal that the world is warming. The problem is, we don't think in terms of the whole world. Global is kind of an abstract idea. So I want to show of hands, how many people consult the weather forecast every day in Saskatchewan? How many people check the temperature? Looks like just that everybody. How many people get up and say, I wonder what the temperature of the world is today? <laughs> really? What kind of occupation are you in? <laughs> or you're retired? Okay. Very few people get paid to think about the entire world every day. There's a few people. Uh, but most of us are concerned about where we live, our home. And for most of us, our home is a fairly small place. We don't venture very far on a daily basis. So we want to know what's happening to the climate where we live. Well, that's a much more difficult question. Because if we look at the entire world, we have a huge amount of data. And as we go down and down and down to smaller and smaller areas, we end up less and less information. But if you want to know how the climate is changing in Saskatchewan, how we are affected by global warming, you should look at the lowest temperatures. Global warming should be obvious on our coldest days. So what I did was, I downloaded, anybody can do this, just go to the Environment Canada website, download the coldest temperatures every day over winter temperature when we get up in the morning, an average. Well, we love to whine and complain about our winter, so so many people think we had a cold winter this year. And we've already forgotten about it by now. But people feel like we just went through a cold winter. Well, maybe. There is the average daily low temperature for this past winter, around 20 degrees below zero. Was it cold? Well, compared to the last 30 years, yeah, it was a relatively cold winter, although a bunch of winters were colder. It was below average. Now let's compare it to the winter temperature of Jaya since we began collecting weather information. And you'll see that this past winter would have been an average winter in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, and it would have been a warm winter early in the history of Regina. In other words, our winter has warmed a lot. From in the early days, an average of minus 21, to now an average of about minus 17 in our lowest temperatures. In other words, that's a four degree increase. It may not seem like much, but you know, 60,000 years ago, the temperature of the world dropped by about two or three degrees and a glacier formed and covered all of Canada, except the Cypress Hills. So it only took a two or three degrees decrease in temperature to produce the world's largest glacier that's ever existed to cover all of Canada. We're talking about a four degree increase in the last 120 years of China. In other words, we can conclude that Saskatchewan is getting a lot less cold. We're not getting warmer. Our high temperatures aren't getting that much higher. In fact, the highest temperature ever recorded in Saskatchewan, ever recorded in all of Canada, was in my day, yellow grass, in 1937. We haven't been any warmer since 1937. In summer, but our winters have been a lot less cold. Now, this is up to 2018. What's going to happen over the next decade, or the next 30 years or 50 years, 
Unfortunately, we have no data. We're waiting for some smart, young entrepreneur to figure out how we can measure the temperature of the future. It hasn't been done yet. So we have to use what scientists call models. It's like a big video game. We simulate the climate of the world, we make sure the model works, and if it works, then we run the model forward. And every country has a model. The US has a bunch of models. And here's what the results look like. This is helped with a whole bunch of models. Every triangle is a different model. And it's the change in temperature along the vertical axis and the change in precipitation along the horizontal axis between the recent past, up to 2000, and the middle of this century for Western Canada. And on the left, winter, if you follow the numbers on the vertical axis, winter is going to warm anywhere between 1 and 6 degrees by the middle of this century. It's also getting wetter. Most of the models indicate we can expect more precipitation in winter. Now it's going to fall as rain, not necessarily as snow, but more water in winter. Summer is different. In fact, we can summarize these two graphs using words, English words instead of numbers. We expect winter, and it already is, is getting warmer and wetter. Summer, a little bit warmer, but drier. So this has a lot of important effects on water, agriculture, forestry, the ecology, and I'll talk about a few of those effects. But first of all, we should get up and do the dance. Because our winters are getting warmer. It sounds awful good. I hate to admit it, it sounds awful good. And there are people that are saying that global warming is great for Canada. People like Professor of Economics at Yale, an anthropology professor in Liverpool, saying, bring it on. Canada, Russia, they're lucky out. I'm not sure if these academics have ever been to Saskatchewan. <laughs> Everybody thinks of Canada as being cold all the time, everywhere, and it's getting warmer. Even the, the United Nations is saying that Canada is going to benefit from a warming climate and become one of the top three exporters of wheat. Sorry, but we already are. <laughs> not that wrong. And then there is some actual science done by Canadian scientists at Agriculture Canada saying that our growing season is getting longer, there's more heat, and winter is less damaging. So we can expect higher crop productivity. And here's a PhD thesis done at the U.S. by Santosh Pudel. And he says on the left, here is the production of wheat at swift current from 1970 to 2000, varies from year to year. Here's the production of wheat in the future. For 30 years in the future, it's much higher. Much higher wheat yields. But notice, from year to year, the really high or really low. So I think the more important information here is farmers have to be prepared for bumper crops one year and crop loss is the next. Because one of the most obvious impacts of a warming world is the increase in the extremes between very wet and very dry. And also, there are advantages to a cold winter. We are losing that advantage. Coal keeps out a lot of nasty stuff. So there are scientists who are doing research to show that as a result of a warmer winter, we can expect more pests, more pathogens, more weeds, and some of the more serious impacts of global warming, perhaps the most serious, is on health, human health, animal health. They say that minus 40 keeps up the riffraff, I think that's a expression we use in my not. But historically, we've had to deal with a lot less in terms of pests and invasive species 
pathogens, disease vectors, and they're appearing in our crops, in our pasture, and in our bodies. And then the other huge advantage of coal is snow. Snow is fantastic. Most of the water that we consume is melting snow because it builds up over the winter. You can measure it. You can put a stick in the snow and say, that's how much water we expect in the spring. The snow melts in the spring and fills up our lakes and ponds, our sloughs, our reservoirs. Snow's great. It's natural storage of water. We're going to be getting our water by rain in the future, not by snow. And rain, of course, just runs off. So we might have to build, unfortunately, we might have to build dams if we don't have snow, which is an unfortunate consequence of climate change because you have to collect the water before it runs away. If you have snow, you don't have to collect the water. It just builds up. And the fact is that most of the people in Saskatchewan get their water here in the Rocky Mountains. If you live in Moose Jaw or Saskatoon or Regina, which is most of the people in Saskatchewan or even some other cities, you get your water from Lake Deaton Baker. And Lake Deaton Baker fills up from right off in the Rocky Mountains. And here's just one issue, and that's potash mining. Here are some operating mines, some proposed mines for southern Saskatchewan. These are solution potash mines. They need water to extract the potash. And they're all getting their water from Lake Deaton Baker. Now, it sells Kapow River, but if you know anything about the Kapow River, most of that water is diverted out of Lake Deaton Baker at the Kapow Dam and into the Kapow River. And by far, the largest consumer of water in Saskatchewan, by far, is the potash industry. So, we have to be a little bit concerned, and they should be concerned. And if they want to be mining potash 30, 50 years from now, they better make sure there's going to be enough water. Now here's some more science. I'll just gloss over this. I'm working with a brilliant scientist, Dr. Elaine Barrow, who lives in Cathedral. Very modest person. Um, does great science. And here's what we expect in terms of precipitation going right back to 19, 1850. So anything in, in gray has already happened. The colored stuff is the future. And there's a bunch of different scenarios because we can't possibly predict the future. We can only project or forecast. But if you follow the red lines, that's sort of the average. And so you can see precipitation is going up in winter, it's going up in spring, it's going up a little bit in fall, but it's going down in summer. When do we need water? We need water mostly in the summertime, especially if you grow stuff. And then temperature is going up all every season of the year, but especially in the winter. Now, these are long-term trends, okay? It's showing that by the end of the century, is gonna be a lot warmer. Well, who cares? We're not gonna be here. I'm not gonna be here. I'd love to be able to sit in a rocking chair and do some whittling and say, yeah, yeah I guess we were right about the whole but I'm not gonna be here. <laughs> we're not gonna be here. We don't deal well with these slow incremental changes. Here's one of us smiling. You know, we got it, we got it pretty good. We got it awful good compared to the rest of the world. We have ups and downs. There's some ups and downs on the curve. But the water is gradually going down in blue, and the temperature is rising in brown. At what point is there too much change? Well, our colleagues in sociology, psychology, economics, say that people just aren't wired to deal with this. And here's one quote. The most serious and pervasive problems we face, we are inherently adept at long-term planning because we are myopic when it comes to time. We deal with the immediate well we don't deal with the future well. Because throughout most of human history, we didn't have to. We didn't think in terms of the future. 
we felt in terms of where our next meal was coming from. So at what point will we notice that there's too much climate change? Well, I was having coffee at the Naked Bean with Elaine Barrett, my colleague, and I said, Elaine, can we address that question scientifically? I mean, there's lots of psychological experiments about at what point do people realize there's been too much change. But let's do, deal with it scientifically. And let's think in terms of what's called the signal to noise. The signal is global warming. The noise is just the natural climate of Saskatchewan. And the best analogy is a restaurant. Here's a restaurant, you know, you're trying to be heard or hear your friend, and it's really noisy. The signal is what you want to hear from your friend. The noise is just the clatter and the background conversation. So we actually measured the signal and noise in these climate models. And in terms of temperature, a signal of one to two means that the signal is stronger than the noise. And it shows that within the next 10 years, we should be noticing unusual temperatures in Saskatchewan if we haven't already. But when it comes to precipitation, and water is the most important variable in Saskatchewan, we probably won't even notice global warming until about the middle of the century. Why? It's because there's so much noise. Our water varies so much from season to season, year to year, decade to decade, just naturally, that it just sort of obscures what's happening in terms of climate change. So I'm kind of sympathetic when people say, I haven't seen climate change. I'm saying, yeah, because you live in Saskatchewan. It's the hardest place in the world. Saskatchewan and Mongolia are the hardest places in the world to see climate change because they're the two places that have the most extreme and variable climates. So I was giving a talk to a bunch of farmers, which I do often, um, and this person who manages an irrigation district said, Dave, nice talk, but I'll believe in climate change when I get unexpected weather. What is unexpected weather in Saskatchewan? You can expect anything. <laughs> right? So I gave a talk at Swift Current, I'm coming back to Swift Current, I'm near Mortlock, and I see a fire, so I pulled off the road. This is in April. It's bone dry, and there's a prairie fire. April is usually our wettest month. The snow is melting. So, I'm sympathetic. But the scientists say that we notice a change in the extremes. This is how we perceive things. We don't, as humans, we don't really perceive averages. Averages is just an abstract concept. We notice tall people and short people. We notice extremes. We don't notice average. So we've noticed that on the prairies in the last 10 years, there's been all these extreme events. The flooding in Calgary, the flooding in southeastern Saskatchewan, southern Manitoba, the fire at Fort Mac, the fire at Slave Lake, and all these extreme events. And here's some insurance numbers, billions and billions of dollars that's costed government and insurance companies just in Western Canada. And now scientists are discovering that these events would have occurred anyway, but they were worse because they occurred in a warm climate. Just a little bit more severe, a bit more rain, a bit more flooding, a bit drier, because these natural events were occurring in a warmer climate. Once again, the information is more conclusive. If you look at, you know, we're talking about a sample size of eight, but how about a sample size in the thousands? Fantastic climate change research done by insurance companies. Because they're on the hook, right? So here's the largest insurance company in the world. They've been measuring disasters back, way back, and they're going up, with one exception. The red ones are geological disasters. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tsunamis have nothing to do with the climate. Therefore, they're not going up. Anything related to weather and climate is going up. And so the insurance companies are saying global warming is causing our climate to be more volatile, extreme, and disastrous. 